Okay, this is uh, going to be completely unscripted, uh, but what the heck, what could possibly go wrong? So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the CG SQL system. And uh, CG SQL kind of stands for code generation for SQL, or it might stand for C generation for SQL or other things like that. Uh, maybe it should have stood for C generation for SQLite, because really it's about SQLite, but that's already a mouthful. So CG SQL. And it includes uh, the sort of star of the CG SQL system, which is the CQL compiler. And that system basically takes source code that's kind of like a stored procedure um, and schema definitions and generates C code uh, for that so that you don't have to type um, C code directly to the SQLite 3 API. Uh, the SQLite 3 API is actually really easy to use. But um, I think a lot of people are used to doing cogen against it because uh, it has ordinals in lots of places. And so if you change the queries, then uh, the ordinals might have to shift. And uh, the binding APIs and data fetching APIs are all type specific. And everything is sort of type neutral. So it's very easy to fetch an int32 when you meant to fetch an int64. Um, and it's very easy to forget to check if your column is null, if it's a nullable column and stuff like that. So it's good to have a code generator that does those sorts of things for you um, so that you don't end up making those mistakes. And the CQL compiler is very good at that, as we'll see. So uh, this will just be a brief introduction and I'll walk through uh, some of the things to give you a sense of um, what it does. Uh, let me just start by pointing you at the happy little readme file that is at the root of the uh, directory and it shows you various things like how to do a test pass. You know, it even has pointers to the dev cycle. Um, it has the number one gotcha. If you're running this on a Mac, you need to make sure you have a more recent Bison than the one that ships with um, Xcode because that's really old, v2.3. Um, so, but it's pretty easy to get one. Um, and if you're running on Ubuntu, you might find that some of the tests fail because the default version of SQLite on Ubuntu is fairly old also and it doesn't have uh, the latest features, uh, especially around explain query plan, and that'll cause one of the tests to fail. So, but it's pretty easy to fix all those things. So actually building it is super simple. Um, in fact, the whole, I mean, if this project has a theme, it's keep it dumb as rocks. Um, the whole thing is just trying to be very, very straightforward and very approachable. Um, it's full of comments. Um, so as compilers go, I think it's comparatively easy to understand. And uh, later I'll do some videos on kind of the internals. Um, building it, just make clean. You don't even have to do that if it's your first install. Make clean and then make and it builds super fast. So let me switch to a command line window and we'll do some like some live demos. And like I said, this is totally unscripted. So this is just, you know, watching me live code with this thing. So, okay, let me just first build it. Okay, this is gonna be exciting. Boom. Uh, we're done, okay? Uh, so that's it. And it, that built the runtime and the compiler itself. Uh, there's just not that many files. I recently added a test to make sure that you have a recent bison and it'll whine if you don't um, because I figured a lot of people were going to hit that. So that added, um, you know, 10% to the output. It's actually very straightforward. Um, running the test passes um, is actually just as straightforward. I'll just, you know, I'll just do it. I usually do it like that, uh, but you could do dot slash test.sh. It doesn't have to be the born shell and you don't actually get the born shell when you run sh on a Mac anyway. So it has various stages and it tries various things and um, it has uh, abundant logging, but like the, the test script itself is very straightforward as well. So all it does is invoke the compiler and scrape the output looking for various different things. And then there's different stages. There's, uh, there's tests that simply verify that parsing works. Uh, there's tests that verify that semantic analysis happens correctly. So just the semantic analysis pass happens and it scrapes the AST looking for certain things like this node should have been of this type, this node should have been of that type, this should have caused an error, this should not have caused an error, stuff like that. Um, there's lots and lots of errors um, that it checks for over 300. So I'm already in the sources directory. Let me back up one. Uh, okay, and that's kind of you know what you find at the root. And the most important thing is this directory. Okay, and that has piles of interesting stuff uh, the guide itself um, has a, an abundance of, of, um, of goodness. If we just do open guide.html, that's probably going to go to my second monitor. Okay, it's not. Great. Um, actually, recently we landed up um, uh, a poll that's going to have 
uh, this having an outline. Um, someone helped me with Pandoc, so thank you very much. Um, and there's just lots of stuff here through the tutorial. There's like a little hello world program. We're going to go through that. Um, there's, you know, a treatise on each of the language features, order of operations, lots of stuff. The, the theme of it, it was highly motivated by the C programming language. And I even used the same examples in a few places. Um, it's fairly approachable and it covers lots and lots of the tool. Um, and if I just scroll very quickly to the end, there's lots, okay. Um, it goes over the, the grammar, uh, the formal grammar, and all the errors have you know documentation. Um, so you can look up any given error and get some hints as to what happened and why that error is generated. Um, and if you have access to the source code, it's easy to grep for them. Um, it also has a grammar for the JSON output. The tool can produce JSON that describes what the input was. Uh, so if you want to do uh, further processing of the stuff, you can um, you can create other uh, bits of code and so forth, starting from the from the JSON schema. Um, also included is this guy, um, and uh, this is you know an automatically generated railroad diagram of the same grammar, and uh, this is just lovely. This is a beautiful little tool. And um, so you can kind of have a look at what all these shapes are. Uh, my favorite feature is you can kind of click on any of the non-terminals and it takes you to them. And you can even find like any pla other places where that non-terminal is used and click on those. So you can surf the grammar pretty easily, you know, without having to go through all the different places. So like, you know, the different types of numeric literals and other literals. And, you know, here's how you can uh, do a raise inside of a trigger and the syntax for calls. Anyway, you get the idea. This this goes on and on. Um, the grammar is actually quite extensive. So, uh, but it's still a subset of, um, well, sort of a subset. The SQL part of it is a subset of what SQLite supports. Um, but of course, it also adds the uh, uh, some elements from say Transact SQL, as we'll see. So variables, loops, and whatnot. Um, and uh, so, but the SQL part doesn't actually cover all of what SQLite supports, although in, it's increasingly a larger and larger subset. So most SQLite programs should compile without too much in, in the way of changes. Um, it's important to know that CQL is strongly typed. Uh, CQL is, um, you know, a full compiler and it looks at the data types for the schema and then it does all this type inference to figure out all the types of everything in your expressions and in your select statements, and it will produce the usual kinds of type checking errors. Um, and as a consequence, you'll have to put in casts and other kinds of things like that in places where you might not have needed them um, in straight SQLite. Uh, SQLite is very forgiving and it does automatic conversions in lots of places, um, which is fine, but um, we found that a strongly typed language uh, was more helpful for maintaining lots and lots of these guys. and and especially for getting very large queries correct. Um, when you're you know, producing very large queries with especially union all sections, it's very helpful to have strict typing to make sure like all the branches of the union all are producing exactly the same types and all the column names match and all that other jazzola. So there's lots of checking um, as, you'll, as you'll find. Um, so let's, let's get started and just kind of look at a program. Um, that's probably the easiest way to go. So, uh, let me just uh, call this, I don't know, uh, x.sql. That sounds good. Uh, and I'm using high tech for editing. Uh, so how about I just do this, create proc, uh, hello. Okay, again, this is totally unscripted. Call printf, hello world. Okay, there we go, there's a call. Now already you'll notice I'm using double quotes and escapes, okay? Um, CQL supports double quotes. Uh, SQL only supports single quotes. Double quotes mean something totally different. And back, backslash n doesn't mean anything special inside of single quotes. And if you want to put a new line um, in a quoted SQL string, you have to actually put the new line. Um, and uh, that turns out to be not always very helpful. And we had lots of cases where we needed escape sequences. So uh, the double quoted things are converted to single quotes um, if they need to go to uh, SQL, um, as we'll see. But let, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's try to just build this guy. Okay, uh, so I do, oh, I'm in the guide directory. Okay, so let's let's move that. Uh, let's move this to dot dot slash sources. Okay, so now I'm in the root of the uh, CQL directory, which is where I usually find myself standing. So I should be able to say out slash CQL 
dash dash in x dot sql. Okay, this is the most simple way to use the tool. Okay, so all it just did there was it parsed it, made the tree, and then spit it out again. Um, and so this, these were some of the earliest tests that I did. Um, and all that's doing is basically canonicalizing the SQL. So if there had been, well, heck, why don't I just do it? Uh, let me, you know, add some spaces and put some goofy stuff like this. And I don't know, I'm gonna just do all kinds of weirdness. Okay, right, same thing, because it was parsed to the AST and, and back out again. Okay, so that's the simplest thing you can do to make sure that um, the syntax of your program is, is right. There's very little error checking here, but you know, like if I did this, okay. Okay, great, so got an error, right? So on line three, okay, we don't have to look, it's this call X business, okay. All right, so that tells you it parses. The next thing you can do is you can add the fabulous um, semantic analysis flag mostly these only come up in testing you know so like you'll see this if you're looking at the make files and the and the and the test thing but you know that did semantic analysis on it um, and produces no no extra output other than the canonical if you add this you get the AST okay and so here we've sort of echoed the program back out at you and there's the there's the tree um, and the tree shapes are pretty uh, pretty convenient. Um, already you can see the string literal. Notice that it's been unescaped. So um, enough about the diagnostic output. I, I think we just, let's just do some code and invoke the compiler sort of the way that anyone really does it. Um, so let me just get back to my focus here. Okay, so usually you use the cogen options and you do this for the standard cogen. It's gonna produce a header and, uh, and a C file. Okay, so if we, we could just look at this real quick. So uh, let's look at the header first. Okay, this has the prototype of the function that you just created. Um, and so you can include it in other places. And in this case, it takes no args. It's just a very straightforward little function. Um, you don't even need a database um, to use this function because no, no database calls were made. Um, so it's just very, very straightforward. And then if we look at uh, the C code, um, you'll see this is also very straightforward. Um, it you know has some things that are part of the standard header because um, uh, the compiler you know is going to generate like the optimal parentheses in places and so um, and it knows order of operations and so I don't want to hear about warnings that I maybe don't know about order of operations. Um, that's why those are there. But otherwise, it's very straightforward and it was just turned to a uh, turn into a printf call. So by default, um, if you don't declare the uh, function, then it turns into a straight up C call and it passes C style arguments. Okay. Now remember I told you that we were going to do um, string escaping and so forth, but here this is actually that string is going to the C compiler, not to SQLite. And so it needs to stay looking like a C string. So um, this is sort of part of the two headed nature of this beast, right? It's uh, sometimes producing C, string, C code and sometimes producing, you know, Nazi code. And so depending on which situation it's in, it might have to escape things differently or not. And in any case, it's almost always going through the C compiler. So it has to be C escaped for use in SQL um, as we'll see. Okay, so um, can't quite run this, right? Because it's, it, the, it's a method called hello. So usually you need to create something like your main. So let's call that main.c. Okay, and then I'm just going to do pound include x.h, uh, and then I'm going to do main. Uh, main. Oh, we have lots of typos. Rz char start by rz. Hello. Great. Okay, that's all we need. And so at this point, I should be able to say cc dash o. I don't know x x.c main.c and that should work okay and notice i didn't even include sqlite because there was no reference to anything um, so if i do dot slash x boom hello world fabulous okay uh, not very exciting right but okay still interesting enough uh, that i can show you some of the flow control stuff before we even get into database stuff so i'm just going to run with this for a little bit um okay so we could also do something like this uh, Declare x text not null set x colon equals hello 
world. And then we can do copper and daft. How about percentage slash not oh, percentage X. That sounds good. Okay. Okay, there's our regenerated code. Let's have a look at this now. Okay. Okay, so what's going on here? Lots of interesting stuff. Um, so we made a string literal, okay? And that does this and we gave it a name. That's just so that the string literals can be pooled. A lot of times the string literals have um, the same content um, and they need to have unique names. So usually the, the um, uh, string literal has you know, fragments of the text as part of the, um, as part of the name. Okay, so here it's the hello world uh, string inside of the hello method to give it a unique name. Um, and then we turn that string reference into a C string. Um, and this allows for there to be a conversion. And as you'll see, this helper function can actually be defined in, in places. In this particular case, it does very little, um, as we can see. Then we call printf on that, and then we freed the C string. And, and then we released the string literal. Okay, so... Um, all the objects are on this sort of retain release kind of plan and the object types are strings, blobs, and objects. Uh, objects you can't get from the database, but you can pass sort of, it's a pointer to something, uh, things through to CQL. So this is just a very simple little thing and it did, you know, a string allocation. And uh, if we then compile it like we did before, we should get like exactly the same thing. And, oh, okay, right, so perfect, okay. Now we started using something from the CQL runtime, so I'm going to add the CQL runtime. And, okay, and now, because we did that, we need to add SQLite 3. Okay, great. So this is how you can tell it's unscripted. Okay, great. So, um, interestingly, if I had pulled in CQLRT as a library rather than just adding the source of it, um, it, it, none of those functions were actually used, so we didn't really need lib SQL, uh, didn't need the SQLite 3 library, but um, to make the example easier, I, I just went ahead and did that. So you can already see kind of the things that are implemented in that SQL runtime, and um, they're pretty straightforward. Um, and um, yeah, okay, so not too much crazy there. Uh, so let, let's change it up a little bit more, and we can see some of the other things that we're capable of doing. Um, so how about, um, uh, let's see, let's just do, let's do a loop. Okay, a little bit of, yeah, we'll make it I. It's quite a bit more verbose than C is but ultimately it's pretty isomorphic. Okay, so a little bit of a while loop. All right, great. So that should compile. Okay, there's our, and there's our CC uh, dot. Okay, didn't work. Why? Because it's helpful to do like so. Recompile, recc. Okay, lots more exciting. Let's have a look at x.c. Okay, look at this pattern. It's a little bit different than you might expect, okay? So the loop is always on the outside, 477, uh, 477, it always uses this pattern. Then it does the expression and a break inside, okay? And I'll show you why in just a second. And then you see your actual uh, loop. And so it's indented a little funnily kind of to help you remember that this if is actually sort of part of the for, but let me show you what's going on there. Um, Cause uh, this is an important part of cogen when you start seeing the cogen. So let me change this to, I'm just gonna make a super simple change that will illustrate this. I'm gonna say the integer is possibly nullable. Okay, so now I have a nullable integer. So what does that look like? Okay. Um, Great, okay, and uh, well here, let me just show you that it does in fact run still, yeah, okay. Now, so 
A nullable int32. Okay, a nullable int32 is a struct that has a boolean that says whether it's null and, it, and its value. Okay, and then there's a little helper macro that sets the the boolean uh, to be null. Um, and here we made uh, a temporary bool and we set that to null as well. Okay, so here we set i um, to zero, not null. Okay, so two things are happening in that assignment. Both the, it, it's now not null and it's also set to the value zero. Then, okay, what we do is we say, um, we make, there's a temporary bool here. So we're gonna copy the value of um, this, whether i's value is less than five, okay, and whether i is null into this temporary Boolean. So we needed a temporary Boolean to capture the value of the expression i less than five because i less than five, because i is nullable, might be nullable. So because it's nullable, it, you can't hold it in an expression. So um, statements are gonna be required to evaluate it. And so in this particular case, what we did was we computed the value of i less than five and we computed its nullability. And actually the way this macro is set up, this won't be evaluated if this is false, okay? So ultimately we get in this temporary Boolean, either a null Boolean if i was null or the Boolean value, whether I was less than five. Okay, now we have to do, if, if that Boolean is not true, then break, okay? And so, uh, so the helper macro is nullable true, checks the is null and it checks the value. Now, all of this happens automatically for you so that if you're using nullable expressions in your code, it's always gonna remember that they might be null and it's gonna do the standard SQL null arithmetic on those guys. Now, as a consequence, you couldn't put this condition inside here between those little semicolons because in general, it needs statements to evaluate to a Boolean. So if nullability happens or if other wonky stuff happens, um, then the extra statements are gonna go right here after the four and then there's gonna be the test and then there's the loopy part. So here, all I did was you know, force the cogen to create nullable cogen style, which forced the issue for statements. All right, so generally the nullable objects uh, for the nullable printfs are a struct and any kind of arithmetic you do on them um, requires this sort of, you know, uh, nullability checks and whatnot um, and all these temporaries in between so that you um, have the uh, accumulating value sort of computed and stored, including its nullability. Great, okay, so that's what the C looks like. Um, the header file is actually completely unchanged. Uh, we'll just take a quick look, there it is. Okay, it's the same, because the function signature isn't changing through any of this. All right, let's do a little something else uh, to give you another uh, sense of some of the things that you can do. Um, so we did a while statement, um, let's just do uh, let's do something else. Let's do uh, declare f integer uh, not null. We'll stick with not nulls. Okay, j and we're going to do uh, so uh, plus equals three, and then we're going to do set j colon equals case i when one uh, then uh, two one hundred. Uh, when two, then 200, when, oops, when three, then 300, else 100. And, okay, so the case statement in SQL is sort of like the question colon operator on steroids, right? You can have as many cases as you want and they can be completely generic. Um, so here we're gonna have to check I against one, two, three, um, and, and so forth. Uh, notice that, like, as you're gonna see from the cogen, the cogen is very straightforward, so it's not gonna know that i is three and then automatically skip to the third case. It just generates the code. And um, more could be done here to optimize the cogen, but in practice, this kind of jazz doesn't happen in real programs, and so it, there wasn't much call for, for doing this. But if people were ambitious with, con con uh, with constant folding, um, more could happen here. So let's build this. Out. Okay, uh, we'll look at x.c. Okay, so this is another example of when 
um, a single expression requires multiple statements. Okay, so here's i and j, okay, and here's a temp. Okay, so first we set i equals three. Then this is the classic block shape for a case statement. We capture the current value and look at that. Oop, there's a bug, the indenting's wrong. Okay, uh, temp int i equals i. Okay, so we wanna evaluate the expression in the case exactly one time. So we always store it in a temp. Okay, so, cause this could have been, you know, the, the case expression could have been fairly complicated. So we store it in a temp. Then we check the temp against one. If it's one, we set j to 100 and we break. If it's two, we set j to 200 and we break. If it's three, we set j to 300 and we break. Otherwise we set j to 400. And at the end here we have while zero. So this loop is never repeated. Okay, the whole point of having this loop was so that we could do these breaks um, and have a nice sort of structural kind of thing. Okay, and that's the code gen for, um, for the uh, case statement. And actually, if we do this, um, maybe we could do something interesting like, um, I don't know, how about this? Let me, let me generalize it a little bit. Set i plum equals zero, while i less than five, no braces, no parens, begin and temp day. J, okay, so now we should actually do something. Okay, oop, what do we got here? At line nine, what, what did we do wrong? Oh, call. Great, okay. And, okay, oh, and look at that. Wouldn't you know it? You think I would have learned the first time. Okay, great. And that, that backslash was me uh, hitting the backslash. It's, it doesn't type the backslash, that was, I typed it. Okay, so um, you can see 400 is the default. So we got 100, 200, 300, and then when, when we got to four, you get the idea. Um, so the output's just a little bit different. Now, if we look at this, right? Again, we'll see, okay, here it is. The, we see the text of the program having been canonicalized. And we have sort of, you know, the if is inside of the loop and, and so forth, um, and that's there. Now, um, we could change the program up just a little bit. Okay. Um, how about this? Uh, This is a bit goofy, but when i less than five, then one, else zero. Okay. okay, so really cheesy way to get a one or a zero. Okay, but this will illustrate that the, ex the expression inside of the while could be complicated. And if it is, then life becomes more, okay, here's x dot c now. So you can see at this point, the do loop, okay, is right here between the for and the if and the answers in the, in the temp. So again, this is because in general, evaluation of the SQL statements might require um, a bunch of uh, C statements. And so an expression is frequently not adequate. So all the code patterns are set up so that um, there's room for statements to be inserted in between the evaluations and the use of the temporaries. And we can like hoist out the temporaries. Um, generally, it tries to keep it as simple as possible. So where uh, uh, simple expressions work, like here, for instance, okay? There's no extra temporaries needed there. This plus is perfectly, can be perfectly well evaluated. So as long as you're sticking, combining non-nullables um, in straightforward ways um, that can be done with C expressions, you continue to get a C expression and you get these sort of explosions of statements when you start using case operators and um, and like the in expression, you know, the in expression has very similar code gen. So here, let me let me do the silly, uh, a silly in case as well. Uh, while I in uh, zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, great, dumbest in statement ever, uh, but there you go. Okay, and let's look at x.c. Great. 
So there you can see it. N notice that it got transcoded to the canonical shape. Um, and here's the here's the the in. Okay. So we we um, we take the uh, the temporary boolean and we check to see if it's zero. If it is, we break. If otherwise, we break. We break. We break. So um, basically, what's happening here is the the affirmative result. Um, is stored in the temporary boolean, which becomes the answer. And if we ever get to the default case here, the temporary boolean is changed to zero. Um, and again, it's this do while zero sort of thing. So if if the uh, expression we're evaluating is one of the uh, is in one of the cases, we'll get the the default value of the expression. Otherwise, we get the alternate value, and then that turns into the if uses that temporary boolean um, in its predicate. So. Again, it just all sort of flows into that same sort of pattern. So you'll see these do while zero things for in expressions and whatnot. Okay, so that's all great. Um, and that lets you use some of the same SQL constructs in your C expressions. And let me just compile it so you can see. It, it's, it should be all the same, right? Yeah, it's exactly the same with the same 400, 100 particular case stuff is still there. So you can use lots of SQL constructs in your C code. Um, in your uh, SQL code, rather, and it will land in uh, straight C as flow of control. So generally what's going on here is that um, the, the C part, let me go look at Excel SQL, the control flow part of your stored product, the variables and whatnot, they're turned into straight C code, and the SQL part um, gets turned into SQL code, and it does something, right? It does like whatever you want it to do. So let me um, uh, let me do something now, and we'll start trying to do something with the database. So let's do create table. I don't know pi um, x integer not null, y integer not null. Great. So now we have a high table, and we're going to do call hello. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to say I'm going to get rid of all of this. I'm going to say um, clear i integer not null. Um, and then I'm going to do um, while i less than 5, begin, and how about I remember to set i uh, for n equals i plus 1. Okay, and then I'm going to do insert into i uh, xy, um, and it's going to be i and i times 100. So then I'm going to do uh, declare C cursor for select star from pi, uh, loop fetch C, call printf percent D percent D slash n C dot x C dot y, um, and Okay, so that should give me a whole pile of printing. So let's see how that goes. First, let's see if I made any typos. Wow, that was pretty impressive. Okay, let's look at the code we generated. Um, well, actually, let's try to let's try to link it, and we'll see what happens. That's not going to work, right? Okay, so what happened? Let's look at x.h. Okay, now it's using the database. Okay, so two things. It now takes an implied uh, database parameter. Okay, um, so in the C code, you have to hand it a database uh, to kick it off, and it's going to return um, an, an, an integer uh, for the success code, just like any SQLite method does. And those are going to be SQLite return codes, like SQLite OK, SQLite O. You get the idea. And it warns you if you didn't, if you ignore the return code. So we need to change hello, and I'm going to crib some code here. Uh, let me have a look at. Let's see, uh, demo client, yeah, demo cp. This has the code that we want. Wow, that's way too much code. Okay, we just want this. We want this part. Okay, so we're going to make a database, and we're going to pass that argument there. And probably we should close it, I guess. Let me copy the close code, too. 
Okay, well, I guess apparently we didn't close it in this example. Anyway, it's just an admin to database too. So we're going to make a database. Okay, so I'm going to copy that text so I can use it because uh, I always forget all the stuff. Oops, and I want main.c. Okay, so in main.c, I'm going to do this, but first I have to do uh, sqlite d.h. That should do the job. Okay, and now I'm going to say hello db. Um, and that's probably going to give me a warning, so I'm going to just toss the error in the trash, which isn't recommended, but there you go. Okay, how does that work? Okay, uh, SQL, oh, okay. I had a macro to help me with errors in the other thing, so I'm going to disregard the errors and trust that it's going to work. Okay, great. So at this point, I should be able to do dot slash x. Okay, and we printed a whole lot of nothing. Hmm. So why do you suppose that happened? Well, I can tell you why. Because I knew that wasn't going to work. The whole thing was a site. Okay, let's look at the C code that was generated. Okay, so uh, notice the, the table stuff is just completely gone. Okay, and here we're doing this insert. Okay, great, there's the insert. And we'll talk about that later, but like, um, you can see the first thing we did was an insert. Okay, now the problem here is that table doesn't even exist. Okay, so here's, here's the trick. Most of the time, you're gonna take your schema and stick it in like a dot header file that you wanna pull into a bunch of places. So loose schema like this is actually a schema declaration. It doesn't actually run the create table. So if you wanna run the create table, you have to put it in a proc. If you put it in a proc, it both declares the schema and it'll create the, it'll execute the DML to actually make the table, okay? So um, that should take care of our little problem that we had a moment ago, okay? And the whole reason I did that was to illustrate that, you know, a lot of times you'll do something like this, kind of include, you know, a schema.sql or something like that, okay? And actually that brings me to another point. It's normal to use CQL through the C preprocessor. So um, a typical thing you'll do is not invoke it directly like I'm doing, but uh, run your code through the C preprocessor first and then hand that to CQL. And it processes with pound line directives and so forth so that you get decent error messages. But anyway, we don't have SQL schema, so I'm gonna not address that for now. Okay, and if we do this, okay, um, then we should, okay, great. We're looking a lot better. So now let's actually take a look at what happened in X. Okay, because now we're seeing some actual SQLite stuff. Okay, so the first thing we did was we called SQL exec, create table high, x integer not null, and um, y integer not null. Great, okay, so that made the table, and this just calls um, the SQLite 3 ex uh, exec. Um, there's a standard way that I call it with standard strings, so to avoid the extra args and save code, I have a little helper that just basically takes the, the core arguments and forwards them along. Um, so it's a little curry, if you will. SQL exec is a little curry. If anything goes wrong, it calls, uh, it does a go to SQL, SQL cleanup. So the normal thing is if there's an error, um, the procedure exits um, and there's try catch. Um, so you can do that stuff. Then here's our loop, okay? Uh, and we have I started as one and uh, I started as zero rather, um, actually took advantage of that. Um, the non-nullable start initialized at zero. Okay, so uh, we did the usual thing. Uh, if, if, well, if, it's, uh, if it's not less than five, then break. Um, so here we did a prepare, and then we did a bind. Okay, so um, CQL multi-bind is gonna call the usual SQLite binding things. But um, again, for economy, there's one result code for if the whole bind succeeds or fails. Um, takes the DB pointer once, so it has to be pushed on the stack once. Um, there's uh, the temporary statement that we just prepared, okay? Um, so there's that. Um, and, right, so we prepared this temporary statement with these insert values and then we're gonna bind them, okay? And the first, there's two arguments and the first one is an int and the second one is an int, okay? so. Multi, multi bind, and I always say it multi bind because I'm, you know, fifth element. Okay, multi bind. Um, it's just there to save a lot of code gem. Um, these these calls are going to turn into like 
that's an int and and that's an integer. So the args are very, very tight. Um, if you tried to bind them a column at a time, if there were 20, 30 columns, and a lot of times there are, that's a lot of bind calls and it's a lot more code. And this turns out to be really a much easier to read as well. So, um, but multi-bind, all it's gonna do is loop over calling the usual bind arguments. And if any of them fails, um, they're in the result code. If the result code is not SQLite okay, we, we um, go to cleanup. Um, then we try to fetch a row. And uh, if we don't get done, um, then that's an error. And then we finalize the statement and um, away we go. Okay, so all we're doing here is insert, 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 insert. And, and you can see we're just binding the values to, you know, um, uh, to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I and, um, and actually notice that it's the variables that are being bound. So the times 100 is going through to CQL, uh, to SQLite. So I is being bound into both of those slots. So what happens is like in your expression, wherever there are loose variables uh, that are declared as variables, they get turned into those question marks and then they're bound. Okay, so this inserts our five rows. Then we do a prepare for a select. Okay, and notice we said did select star, but we, we actually got X, Y, it automatically expands them. Um, that turns out to be safer for a lot of reasons. Um, and especially, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but if you're doing your own schema and uh, doing schema upgrades, the tables might change. So, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, con the um, what do you call it? The code has hard coded in it, the columns that it's supposed to be fetching. Um, and that's much safer. So uh, we'll, anyway, we'll get into that. So here's select X, Y from high. Um, and then we're just gonna do the usual patterns. We're gonna step. And if we have a row, we're gonna fetch it. And the, the, the multi-fetch is the, the dual of multi-bind. So here we're gonna fetch into the cursor's X and Y field, okay? And the cursor is just a struct. Actually, it has two parts. Uh, the cursor is both a statement and a struct. So the struct has a has row field in it to say whether it's load, the cursor is currently loaded or not. And uh, it has the various variables. And if we scroll up a little bit, you can see there's the, you know, there's what a row looks like. Okay. Um, all cursors keep track of whether there's any references in them that need to be freed. Um, so if there's strings or, or whatnot, then there's a helper that will just free all the, um, all the uh, references. Uh, but in this case, um, there are none, so uh, those are going to be uh, those are going to be big, big fat zeros. Okay, so all we've got is the x and the y, and then we print it, uh, c dot x and c dot y. So that saves us a lot of typing. Um, you know, I mean, typing this compared to what did we have? Uh, at the end, we're going to finalize the statements, uh, both the temporary statement and the and the statement that's associated with the cursor. So we had a temporary statement to do the insert. Um, and then there was um, a sort of not temporary durable statement for the cursor. Cursors, you can do a variety of things with them. In this case, I just looped it to the end, but there's other things you could have done with it. So, I mean, let's go ahead and look at that SQL again, okay? That's just really ridiculously uh, simpler, right? Um, you know, and we could have pulled this out into its own little function if we wanted to and called that. Um, but, you know, this is just super clear compared to the alternative C, and it has all of the appropriate error checking and so forth. So really big, big saver. Um, I, we'll see, and I'm not gonna try to squeeze too much into this one video, but cursors are very, very flexible. You can move data between cursors. Um, you know, you can replace part of a cursor. Um, so uh, a cursor just basically holds on to one row from uh, a, select of, uh, a selection. Um, and you don't actually have to even materialize the cursor with values like this. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that's probably enough for one go. Um, I think the important thing here is it's important to remember that um, it's very much um, a two-headed beast. There's the part that's gonna just be directly forwarded to SQLite. Like any of these uh, DML or DDL statements, um, SQL has like nothing to do with them. They're just gonna, you know, the, the string is gonna be formatted appropriately um, and that's gonna be that. And uh, that's gonna turn into some text. SQLite's gonna process it and give us values back. All the control flow and local variables and so forth, they're converted into straight C, the same C you could have written yourself 
to do this job. And indeed, you probably would have written C very much like this, except for maybe without the multi-fetch helpers. Um, so, and all of this stuff is basically designed to make it comparatively easy to, you know, economically get um, stuff into and out of the database with uh, fairly limited code gen. So um, if there's lots and lots of columns, um, the economies for multi-bind and multi-fetch become really pretty spectacular. But it's very clear here, like, you know, the prepare, you know, that select, it just went right to SQLite. Like, you know, uh, CQL doesn't need to know anything about it. And here, even the, even the times 100, you know, went on to SQLite, it did the arithmetic. So once you're inside of that uh, select statement or insert statement or whatever, all the expressions that are in there are going to be evaluated by uh, SQLite. So the only thing that's going to happen is any variables uh, that came from the CQL world are going to be bound. So they'll turn into question marks and they'll be uh, bound at the appropriate offset um, so that it just, it just works. And so there's lots of inserts. So with this little guy, um, we you know made a little program that uh, just inserts some rows into a table and prints them out. Uh, there's similar examples in the docs, um, and that's probably more than enough for today, so I'll stop there.